I think it was last meeting, could have been the one before, of the legacy project that has already come through the Planning Commission. And um, following some uh, recent meetings with the Corps and uh, Department of Environmental Quality, uh, the development team made some modifications. They're making sort of final modifications. And so that both you and the public is aware of the final state of the project as we approach the, uh, the planned public hearing next month. Uh, Mayor felt it would be appropriate to have another work session to, uh, to brief those things and also to give the uh, development team an opportunity to respond to some of your questions and some of the issues that were raised at the last work session. So what we'll do is very briefly sort of uh, restart the conversation of where we were, what's changed, and then afford an, the, the developer the opportunity to amplify those comments and add his own. And then I've got a couple of things right at, right at the end, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, manager, and good evening, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, the manager basically gave you a good summation of, of where we're at this evening and what our goals are. But unfortunately, I've got to go back a little bit to your main meeting so that you understand the changes that are being proposed um, with the latest uh, submittal of this project. So therefore, if we could, let's go back to our first introduction to this development, which was at your May 26th meeting. It followed the Planning Commission considering the application at its May 18th meeting and offering a, um, a conditional approval on the application. Nevertheless, this is a planned unit development project which includes both residential and commercial <clears throat> uses. It's, on, it's proposed for 101 acres of land on the south side of Victory Boulevard. Uh, remember that some unique characters, characteristics of the project included um, 528 residential units, which there was a mixture of units, including 226 single-family residential, 91 townhomes, and 170 apartment units. Um, and then there was also 11 small cottages, which will be single-family detached condominiums. Um, that are located to the west part at the western end of the site, southwestern end of the site. In addition to that, and one of the most interesting um, environmental features of this development, included 26 acres of integrated wetlands that were both existing and were going to be created. Uh, the created portions were to offset and to mitigate for the impacts to the non-tidal wetlands that are scattered throughout this, the 101 acres. As the manager indicated, back in June, there was a meeting with the wetland and environmental agencies, including the Corps of Engineers and the Department of Environmental Quality, in which uh, the development team received some feedback on the, um, the favorableness or non-favorableness of the integrated wetlands as the mitigation for the project. At that time, uh, the on-site mitigation was not the most preferred method to mitigate. Uh, so some off-site purchase of credits uh, at, a at a wetlands mitigation bank is going to be required. As a result of that, the development team went back and they kind of looked at some of the upland areas that they were going to originally create as a wetland. Um, they are now proposing to um, redevelop or to develop that property into 17 townhomes, um, which is shaded in yellow, and then we have the single family homes, which is shaded in red. And in addition to that, which there is going to be no shading for this, but if you recall um, at last month's, or your last review of this, the development team was proposing um, six apartment units, uh, those of which, which would be fronting on Victory Boulevard, would be three stories in height. The rear apartment units would be four story. However, <clears throat> they are now proposing to make all six buildings a four story, four story units for a total of 200 um, um, apartment units. That number does not exceed the original amount that was shown on the, the uh, conceptual plans that you all received, as they have always proposed 200, even though they had not yet uh, 
yielded 200 in their original proposal. So there is no net increase in, in the apartment units. In addition to that, they have centralized the clubhouse. They've repositioned uh, some of the apartment area just to make it more um, compatible for the residents of, of that um, complex. And then there is an overflow parking area at the western end of the development. It will be shielded from public view by existing vegetation from Victory Boulevard, but this is an overflow parking area for the apartments itself. In addition to us reviewing the um, different revisions of the uh, conceptual plan, we've also received some revised traffic studies. If you remember, that was an issue at the time that you considered this in May, that the traffic studies that were, had been analyzed thus far did not include a connection to City Hall Avenue. Um, there is three basic entrance ways into this development. We talked about that at your last review. And we have since received um, updated traffic studies from both the development team's consultant, the city's consultant, as well as um, VDOT. So Kevin is just going to kind of walk you through that very quickly. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Uh, yeah, as you recall, at your, at your last meeting, uh, we were in some limbo with uh, their traffic impact assessment that they had provided. That had actually been completed, uh, the one that they submitted with their application uh, back in uh, early 20, I think late 2014, uh, November of 2014. So it was um, uh, several months on that report so far, and it did not account for a critical connection to Victory Boulevard um, using City Hall Avenue. Um, I, I have those numbers for you, and I'll just briefly go over those. Additionally, um, we were waiting for some comments by the Virginia Department of Transportation. Um, th those comments and review, it's called a Chapter uh, 527 review, was necessitated not because Victory Boulevard in the city is maintained by VDOT, it's maintained by the city. We do get maintenance funds from VDOT for that. Um, however, due to its proximity, of VDOT maintained roadway in York County, which would be Route 171 Victory Boulevard. Um, because this development will be located within 3,000 feet of that, and um, it will generate 5,000 vehicular trips or more per day, those two um, critical points necessitated this review by VDOT. So I have their comments. They're, they're actually quite brief. I will share those with you as well. Um, but of, of our interest, um, the intersection movements on City Hall Avenue during the a.m. peak hour, which is uh, defined as the hours between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., um, would increase from the no-build conditions at 27 vehicular movements um, to 93 movements um, with the new City Hall Avenue connection. This represents a 244% increase during this hour. Um, and, and of course, that's relative to the, the small number of vehicular trips um, witnessed there now. Um, during the PM peak, which is uh, identified as the hour between 4.45 p.m. and 5.45 p.m., the trips would increase from 96 movements at the intersection to 180 uh, during this time. Um, and this represents an 87.5% increase. Um, during the AM peak, 51 vehicles would be leaving the development headed to Victory Boulevard using City Hall Avenue, while 14 would be entering the development from Victory Boulevard using City Hall Avenue. Uh, during the PM peak, 30 vehicles would be leaving the development headed to Victory Boulevard via City Hall, um, and 54 vehicles would be entering the development this way. Um, while it seems um, that, that there are some negative impacts to City Hall Avenue, their main entrance at Legacy Boulevard, some of the strain would be um, released there onto uh, City Hall Avenue um, because some of those vehicles would be diverted and they would use City Hall Avenue instead, especially those headed towards the main intersection of Victory Boulevard and, and with Creek Road. Um, Specifically, 21 eastbound right turns at Legacy Boulevard will opt to use City Hall Avenue instead um, during the PM peak, and 32 westbound uh, left turns will do the same during PM times. Uh, the level of service from the original report um, remains the same for every intersection studied that's affected by this project. That includes um, 
up to Carey's Chapel um, on Victory Boulevard and the With Creek Road Victory Boulevard intersection. Um, however, City Hall Avenue is negatively impacted and the level of service there drops from uh, level C to D. Um, level of services are A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, F, of course, being the worst. Um, level of service D is generally accepted throughout the industry as, as acceptable. Anything below that um, needs to be mitigated in Term some fashion. Level of service means what? Um, b basically, uh, wait times at the intersections, um, how, how the movements make it through that intersection. Um, it, it, but specifically with um, the movements, the level of service drops from a C to D um, in the AM at City Hall Avenue. And um, that wait time increases from 16.1 seconds to 18.9 seconds. So it's a it's, um, fairly minuscule increase there, but that does drop the level of service um, into a new category. Um, during the PM times, that increases uh, slightly more by eight seconds, 24 seconds to 32 seconds. Uh, new to this most recent traffic impact assessment provided by uh, their traffic um, consultant are new recommendations, um, specifically that the speed limit on Victory Boulevard approaching Legacy Boulevard, their main intersection, um, as well as the secondary entrance, which is uh, just south of where the apartments are proposed, be dropped from 55 miles per hour now to 35 miles per hour um, to increase safety. Secondly, um, that a tra traffic signal warrant analysis at their main intersection be conducted at full build out of the project to determine the need for a traffic signal at the intersection. Um, it, additionally, our uh, Clark Nexon, the city hired consultant, agrees with um, that a traffic signal warrant analysis be conducted at full build out. Additionally, VDOT mentioned that, that there is a need for that. However, they suggested it be done periodically throughout construction of um, the development. For instance, uh, traffic counts be conducted on maybe a yearly basis or at some sort of unit um, number. So that, that concludes the updates on the traffic impact assessment. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Debbie. Um, sure, included in your package, and it's difficult to pull out because it's not on letterhead and it's not signed, but uh, beginning at page three, the third page, it starts with a revised master plan. That document comes to us from the developer and speaks to the issue of uh, traffic. It also, and they'll, I'm sure they'll touch on it, um, a proffered contribution towards improvements to the pedestrian path along the, um, the Oxford Run uh, drainage way. But uh, uh, essentially what they're um, proposing in this language is that uh, at a certain point, and they've identified it two ways here as an either or, um, a new traffic study would be done or an updated traffic study. And if a traffic light was warranted at um, Legacy Boulevard, that they would contribute $250,000 towards its construction. Um, I think that uh, over the, the coming weeks, assuming the council doesn't have any um, significant <coughs> additional feedback, we'll work with them to tighten up this a little bit. I, I, I'm pretty sure I know what their intent is um, but we've been in the process just for finding language with each, with each other on this. Um, also, uh, I would note for you something that was added by Legacy that was in no way a byproduct of our conversation, um, which is on the next page, the top paragraph. It says, essentially, that if the traffic study finds that a light isn't needed, at that point they would contribute $100,000 to the city for improvements to um, Victory Boulevard as, as we might think is appropriate. Um, that, that was something they came up with on their own. Um, as council members uh, may be aware, of the original language um, was again aspirational, fits within this context, and this is, a, this is an iterative step towards quantifying it so that it's easily understandable over time. 
Um, I think they've made the terrific improvements towards that. I think we just need to tweak it a bit more. Um, and I would note to um, the original revised language um, talked about them paying a proportionate share and other things. They, um, they removed that and have, have essentially said if a traffic signal is warranted, they'll contribute $250,000, which is a, a rule of thumb amount about what they cost. Prior to any engineering or anything else, that's, that's if you ask me how much a traffic light on a two-lane road like that would cost, that's what I'd say. And I don't think I'd be off by much in either direction. So I say that, that um, rather than some sort of proportionate share, I believe their intent with their language was to pay for the traffic light if it was needed. And I thought, so we'll, we'll work with them uh, on final language, but I did want to sort of highlight where we were, how we got to where we are, and that you can expect to see um, some slight refinements to this language, which I don't think is intended on our part to in any way change the intent of what they're proposing here. But again, we have to be able to have the common understanding five years from now when all the rest of us have retired and new people are sitting in our seats. And so we'll work on that. Yeah, I'm that. still just truly amazed that a traffic light cost a quarter million dollars. I have a question about the traffic light um, and the money. At what point would it be decided whether one was warranted or not? Is that before people move in or the um, built out all the way? Or? The, what, what they've got here, and again, I'm trying to, I'm not negotiating for Lamont or anybody because I haven't talked to them about this point. Um, what they've proposed in the draft is that at a significant point in the development, which they have referenced in their, um, I think it's the third page, it begins under the section entitled transportation improvements, uh, bottom couple of paragraphs uh, are, the, are the meat of it. At, at about the time of the 400th occupancy permit for residential structures, or 300 of those plus the commercial, whichever happens first, a new traffic study is uh, initiated, paid for by them, which would take, right now they're having to project 100% of what they're going to build into the future. At this point, somewhere two thirds to 75% of it would be there. So the amount of, of future projection is less. Uh, that's part of the sort of final negotiation, but I think the intent was the traffic study showed that as it approached build out that a light might be necessary. So we want to get closer to build out <coughs> before we look at it. And then in, in my view, and we've got some differences of opinion on this as staff as well on timing. Um, but, but I'm generally comfortable with doing it at some point prior to full build out so that if it's needed, we can get it paid for, designed, bid, and constructed before it's needed so we don't have to do that process on the back end, which could take many months uh, to do. We're trying to never get to the critical um, traffic point issue if, in fact, it exists. If I can jump in, Randy, on something to make sure I fully understand the certificate of occupancy, does, does that mean they're ready to go or somebody's there now ready to go in them? They can just be ready. Ready, to go, ready to, go. to go, ready to go in them. So as soon as they're ready to go, not necessarily somebody's ready to move in them. They're ready to go. If you have a house, for example, when it's passed all its inspections and it's ready for someone to move into it, we issue a certificate of occupancy, which is a precondition for lenders and, and sales agreement and all of that. So the house in that example would be done, fully inspected, and ready to be moved into. Whether or not Our anyone not. moved into it for nine months exactly. would be irrelevant to the issuance okay. of the certificate. Because you still have your CEO. Right, okay. and that's a Im very important step in the, in the construction process. That's all I want to say on that. What would you like to, uh, what would you like to do next? Turn it over to Lamont and Buddy and let them sort of walk through the issues. Okay. Um, as they're doing that, I would note one, one other final note. The, um, we got a Final, final version today, right, Kevin? You showed yes, me sir. that. Uh, in your package, uh, council members, is the final version as the date that we had it when we sent the package out on Thursday. So they're, um, 
There may be a minor uh, variation, and I'm sure Lamont or Buddy will speak to that when they talk. But I didn't want you to think, searching the book, saying this, this schematic doesn't match the one in my book. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And, and to continue with uh, what the city manager was saying, um, specifically differentiating from your packet, in this area there are some townhomes. They're now kind of rotated at a 90 degree angle facing a little kind of landscape strip. Um, so it's, it's a very minor change, but that does uh, differentiate it from, from what you received in your packet. Overall unit total is the same. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. Mr. Vice Mayor, members of council, good evening. Uh, I'm Lamont Myers. I'm the Director of Development for Mid-Atlantic Commercial. Uh, with me tonight is our, is our development team, Buddy Spencer, whom you all know, who is the uh, CEO of Mid-Atlantic. Uh, we also have with us uh, Donald Davis, who is the project engineer, uh, Julie Steele, who is our environmental consultant, Chris Lawrence with AECOM, who is our traffic consultant, Brandon Currents, uh, whom you've all met, who is the architect and land planner, designed the community, and Tom Johnston with the Franklin Johnston Group, who will be the apartment developers. Um, I want to just very briefly kind of reiterate and maybe hit on a few points that Debbie, Debbie made. She uh, basically gave my entire presentation, so thank you, Debbie. So this will, this will be a lot easier. Um, and then I will call on Tom. I'd like, and then, of course, all of our team members will be here this evening to answer any questions. Uh, as uh, Mr. Wheeler mentioned, you know, this, these minor tweaks, and they really are fairly minor tweaks to the plan, were necessitated really by, by three things. One were the issues that were raised by the uh, Planning Commission public hearing back in May, uh, the comments that we received, which were uh, which fairly significant comments received from the regulatory agencies on our wetland mitigation plan, and then the comments received from the Virginia Department of Transportation on our, both the original and our revised traffic impact analysis. So I'll, I'll briefly discuss each of these. Um, the issues that were raised at the public hearing in May, there really aren't any changes there from what you had seen at your prior work session. Those issues really related to perimeter buffers, the building setbacks from Victory Boulevard, um, stormwater management and, of course, transportation improvements, which we will address this evening. Uh, we had a, the meeting that we mentioned was at our office. Um, uh, st staff was there, Mr. Wheeler and Ms. Vest were there. We met with the Department of Environmental Quality and uh, representatives from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who are reviewing our wetland application. And as, as uh, Ms. Vest mentioned, our original plan was to fill in the wetland area with some constructed wetlands so that we had a one-to-one -one mitigation for every acre of wetlands that we impacted on the site. We would, we would create a, an acre of wetlands on the site so you had no net loss. You have started, I think, with 26 acres. You would end with 26 acres of wetlands. Uh, at that meeting, we were informed by the regulatory agencies that, that really their preference in, in, their, in their protocol is that we do two-to-one mitigation by purchasing credits off-site. Uh, now, the way that works is if you have to, for example, if you get purchase wetland credits, if there's an existing wetlands bank, you have to work through that, what, that existing wetland bank. If not, if there is no such bank, then you can do other things, including maybe perhaps make a contribution. Uh, in this case, there is one wetland bank that serves this watershed, and that's in Gloucester. It is, uh, and you know, law of supply and demand. There's one bank, so they can kind of charge what they want, and they do. And it's extremely expensive proposition for us. So um, we're not sure of the final number. I can tell you, it's over a million dollars, uh, quite a bit over. So what that necessitated, from our perspective, was how could we take some of the upland areas, as, as Debbie mentioned, some of the upland areas that we were going to originally convert to wetlands and perhaps maybe pick up a few more units to help us partially at least mitigate that additional cost because it's a, it's a pretty significant hit to us. Um, so what we've done is, uh, and, and Brandon is here, he can, if there's any questions, but uh, as you can see there on the, 
the um, area highlighted in, in yellow, that, that area was all, was all upland, and that's an area where we can add a number of townhouse units along a road that was uh, going to be built. And then that block of single family homes that you see would be an addition. Um, so that really are really the only real minor, uh, minor changes or, or increases in, in number of units. I think we added something like, uh, was it 17 townhouses, I believe, or, uh, and uh, 12 single family homes. So that, that was really a big, it was a big issue to us because obviously, you know, you can't absorb that kind of hit without having, you know, there's got to be some, some revenues in there um, you know, somewhere. Um, the other thing, when we talk about the cost of wetlands, the cost of wetlands to us is not just the cost of mitigation. We're also buying a, a fair amount of property in here that are wetlands now uh, that really from a standpoint of, of the community, while they don't really do us a lot of good with regard, we don't really need the density, for example, you know, we feel that we've got a moral obligation to the people we've been working with. I mean, under the leadership of the city, we have been, we started working with all the property owners out there and have been meeting with them for probably at least a year and a half. And our, our commitment to them was that we would find a way to include everyone all the property owners, and we would find a way to treat everyone fairly, whether they had wetlands on their property or not. And so we're, it's certainly our intent that provided we we're able to, to get all the necessary approvals that we'll honor those commitments. And so that cost to us uh, is the cost of purchasing the land as, as in addition to the cost of actually mitigating some of, the, some of those wetland areas. Um, I won't, I'm not going to go into too much on things like the uh, perimeter buffers. We talked about that. I mean, all of our, most everything there is adjacent to uh, developed property. We do have a number of units that, that back up to the Woods of Tab community in, in uh, York County. Those happen to be our deepest single family lots. So you're just simply going to, they'll have single family lots backing up to single family lots. There are about three cottages down in that area that, that touch. Uh, touch the York County border. Again, those are all single family construction. So, and then again, just to reiterate, um, up uh, in that extreme triangle there, we have, uh, uh, you know, what we've done there is, is turned that into a park and garden and, uh, and garden plots. So the neighbors there on Oscars Court, for example, will, will not have anybody in their backyard. That'll all be green space. And so we've tried very hard wherever we have neighbors that we've tried to mitigate any, you know, any impact and, and make it as, uh, you know, as uh, unobtrusive you know, to their existing life, you know, existing uh, views and everything else as possible. Um, the, other, the other big issue, of course, that Mr. Wheeler mentioned was, was transportation. And uh, we have taken those, those comments from VDOT, we've met with staff, and we have, uh, I think, significantly increased, uh, beefed up the, uh, the proffers, as it were. Uh, our original, original plan was, uh, that was in the written document that you were provided, was that we would conduct a traffic study when one of two triggers happened, either prior to the 400th Certificate of Occupancy for Residential or prior to construction of the commercial and the 300th certificate of occupancy. And, and the reason for that difference is if the commercial were built first, that obviously has a, has a significant impact. And I spoke with Chris and we figured that about 100 residential units would roughly compensate for that commercial. So that's, that's why that difference is there. Uh, and that at that point, if this project uh, necessitated a traffic light, we would fund that traffic light. If not, we would put, you know, we would fund $100,000 toward off-site traffic improvements that could be spent as the city sees fit. It's following, uh, following this, this written document that you have, we've, had, we've received, uh, obviously, some more comments and have, have met with staff. And the, the issue, or the... Uh, the issue that, that arose was, okay, well, what if we get to that point and we say we have 400 certificates of, certificates of occupancy and there's not a traffic light warranted, we do this, we put, you know, we put $100,000, you know, up, up, and then we find that at build-out, for some reason, that additional 100 and some units or the commercial actually triggered a light, then what? So we felt that was a legitimate question, and so what we've done, what we, have, we will be, what we will be revising at a proffer, and you will receive a signed proffer statement, uh, obviously prior to the 
prior to the public hearing. But what, we, what we've actually agreed to do then is actually fund a second traffic study. So the way it will work is if, if that first traffic study, if this project warrants a traffic signal, we would fund it. And once we funded that traffic signal, and, and as Mr. Wheeler mentioned, we we're expecting that around $250,000. Once we funded it, then, then our obligation would cease. If, however, the traffic study showed that we did not meet the warrants, then we would put $100,000 in escrow with the city as a good faith deposit. And then at project build out, we would then fund another traffic study. And if that traffic study then came back and said, yes, a light is warranted, we would fund the difference between the 100000 that we'd already put up and the balance of the cost. And if it found that it was not, then the 100000 would be released from escrow for the city to, to, uh, to spend as they see fit. Uh, and then the final uh, transportation improvement, we've talked a lot about trying to increase connectivity, per, uh, pedestrian connectivity, and ultimately some way for people to get over to With Creek Road. So we are also proposing to fund a, a, a cash proffer of $20,000 to be used for a pedestrian path it would be on city property adjacent to Oxford Run for people to be able to walk from Legacy over to With Creek Road. And uh, we would then leave the actual design and construction. That's really up to the city as to how the city would, would see fit. Um, so the only other thing that really is, is much of significance, we had originally, we had talked about what do we do with that little bottom corner there where you see the little yellow uh, uh, rectangle. And we really kind of went back and forth as to what's the best way to handle this Victory Boulevard frontage. Do we do, we do three-story buildings along Victory and then add another building? And uh, the 200 units is very, very important to us, and I'm going to let Mr. Johnson speak to that a little more. But it's very important because we're trying to achieve a level of quality here, and we're trying to, to achieve a, uh, a, an apartment community here that's really much higher end than anything that's been built in the city before that appeals to people who rent by choice, not by necessarily by necessity, but people who really want that lifestyle. And in order to do that, we certain things are important. Elevators are important. Amenity packages are important. Staffing is important. And there's a critical mass of about 200 units to really achieve the economics of scale necessary to do that. And I'm going to let Tom speak to that a little more. But this plan, as I mentioned, does, as Debbie mentioned as well, does call for four-story units then along the Victory Boulevard frontage, which I should point out, you've, you've got, it looks like, and I think I may have misspoke in our last uh, work session in terms of the actual uh, distance from the turn lanes on Victory, I mean, excuse me, from the uh, traffic, existing traffic lanes on Victory Boulevard. It's about 28 feet to the property line. Then you'd have another 25 feet of setback. But by putting the buildings up front, it allows us to put the parking in the back, screen the parking. You have your more attractive structures up front, your commercial and your apartments. And that really gives you a sense of place when you come into the community. It really gives you a sense that you have arrived at some place special. And you're not just looking at, at a parking lot, which we think was, was very important. So. Um, uh, and so I think it really, without uh, any further ado, Tom, if you'd like to come, yeah, on, up. come on up. We're, we're very pleased to have as a part of our team the Franklin Johnston Group. They're one of the premier apartment developers in Hampton Roads. And, um, you know, we're just, you know, we're very happy to have them. And I'm going to call on Tom to kind of talk a little bit about this. And then when he, uh, Tom is finished, we'll come back and, and we'll go and open it up for questions, Mr. Freeman, whoever. Okay, good. All right. Lamont stole all my lines, sorry. Um, in any event, <clears throat> thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. Tom Johnston, uh, Chief Development Officer of the Franklin Johnston Group. I'd like to show a short video about my company and how we see ourselves within the apartment industry, how we develop, how we manage, pictures of some of our communities and how we treat our residents. Then I'd like to discuss the proposed development in a little bit of detail and answer any questions that you guys might have about the apartment community we're proposing. Lights. We are not in the apartment Lights. business. Lights. Or the construction business. Or development. To us, ours in many ways isn't a business at all. Instead, 
we see it as a carefully orchestrated group of complex activities that allow people to build and enjoy a comfortable living environment, to start off in new directions, to bring new life to the world, to stop and smell the roses without having to tend the garden, to live. We provide the environment for people to find themselves, to find each other, and to feel at home. Our founders recognize their responsibility is more than just creating a building, something much more. How cool they you say it all? Commitment, knowledge, teamwork, character, communications, and balance. Our standards are uncompromising. Our communities are innovative, and our management skills are respected throughout the industry. We began creating apartment homes that provided more than just a roof and walls. We saw the importance of excellence from the first moment an architect envisioned a structure. There's a sensitivity to human scale that permeates our design philosophy. And the apartment residences that we designed for the Franklin Johnson Group reflect that scale, that sensitivity to people's lives and lifestyles. Not just because that's a part of our design philosophy, but because it's an integral part of their company's culture too. You'd think that keen sensitivity to design would result in higher costs, but we found it only costs a little more to create something well done. People appreciate the finer things in their residences, like granite countertops, quality fixtures, built-ins, and trim. And while you'll be impressed with those finished details, you'll be even more impressed about what you don't see, like energy efficiency, quietness, and functionality. And the things we do to make our communities last, to require minimum maintenance, and to look as good 20 years from now as they do from the day we open the doors. We have always felt a keen sensibility to the environments in which our creations are made. And we cared long before the environment became the concern of the vast majority of mankind. And we saw the importance of the relationship between what we do and what the entire community does and feels and appreciates. The result of our efforts and the collaborative efforts of our co-creators is a group of communities that each have their own unique story, their own personality. Beautiful dwellings, which allow interaction of neighbors on a level that creates a sense of community and belonging. Communities that offer amenities, allowing for relaxation and comfort in our residents' daily lives. Communities called home by more than 20,000 individuals and families. While our company's portfolio is quite large, we are very much a family business. We have families ourselves, so we try to think of our own living space. We design them for others. We ask professionals to join our team who have the same perspective on life and who can relate to those who call our communities home. Interestingly, there is actually a very business side to our efforts that goes unseen by our residents. At this time, more than 100 organizations and individuals believe so strongly in what we do that they not only collaborate, but also help provide the necessary capital to bring our collective vision together. We develop all our communities from the ground up. We analyze the market, select the sites, determine the architectural themes, and basically craft a deal that works for everyone. Owners, investors, community leaders, and of course our future residents. We deliver to these trusted partners a fair return on their resources. And we deliver to the inhabitants of these special communities incomparable services and comforts. Because we don't just create, we manage as well as anyone in America. We maintain each community to standards that are uncompromising. And we care with the passion that makes our communities places people choose to call home. We are the Franklin Johnston Group. We are the future of apartment home living. Okay, any questions about our company's experience, background, anything about the apartment business in general? Where's your nearest project to here? We have um, several in the peninsula. Uh, probably the closest one people see and recognize is a deal we built about 20 years ago on a lake in Hampton, just across from the Coliseum.
mall area. We haven't been really that active on the peninsula because there's been a little bit of overbuilding on the peninsula and we've waited to find the right spot um, and we think this is it. Is that the H2O project over there? No, it's, um, it's on the lake if you're going uh, east. On, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. Um, went through a renovation about five years ago. Mm -hmm. Is that the gated, is gated community? That one is not. Okay. Um, our most recent communities are in Virginia Beach and up in Northern Virginia. Again, we're very selective in the sites that we choose and because we approach them as cash flow developments with no intent to sell them. So we're very protective about the locations and the barriers to entry so that there's not a bunch of apartments built around us to compete with us. So that's an important factor in how we select sites. Being that this is a very different community than Northern Virginia or from Virginia Beach, tell us why you think it'll fit so well here in Pocosin. Well, one, I think you have a lot of pent-up demand in Pocosin. I think um, while there's been modest employment growth in Pocosin, around the area there's been some decent employment growth. Um, and I think that the apartment industry overall has changed quite a bit in the last 10 years, whereby young people are making choices not to buy, but to rent. Um, the active senior community in your market, I think, is also desiring places to live that are secure, don't require maintenance, and provide elevators. Uh, as, as we all get older, mobility issues become a, an issue. So I see an area that um, is deficient in modern upscale apartments. I see a, a market that has demographics that uh, would appeal to apartment renters. And I see the need for apartments to attract young families to your, your community. Um, what drives apartment demand, honestly, is employment growth. And um, a lot of the demand for these apartments will emulate from some of the large employers around Pocosin not necessarily in Pocosin, but it will attract young, vibrant demographic to your community that doesn't currently live here. If I were to tell you that this is for people, just for people that currently live in Pocosin, it would not be true. Comfort size of these two to four bedrooms? We're proposing um, 200 units. We're proposing 36 one bedrooms. 142 bedroom units, which is the most obviously the most common unit, and 24 three bedroom units, which is a pretty traditional unit mix in the apartment industry. Of course, we're going to study the market much closer and potentially tweak it for more three bedrooms if we believe families is the market, or if it's young professionals starting out, we'll probably go more heavy with the ones. So um, as staff eloquently um, communicated to you, we're, we're proposing um, six apartment buildings of four stories and one uh, large clubhouse facility that will act as the operations center and also the central amenity package for the community. As you can see, uh, you probably can't, but up on the victory, these four story buildings will have elevator shafts such that every floor here will be accessible um, via an elevator. That old, not only means they're accessible um, vertically, but because they're elevator units, they will have to meet all the ADA uh, standards for accessible units, whereas normally that would just be required in 4% of the total units in the community. So the fact that they're elevator, it actually does make them attractive to seniors, and what does that mean? It means bigger door jams, uh, more accessible routes within the apartment for wheelchairs, for walkers, for things of that nature. Um, so anyway, we specifically designed the buildings up closest to Victory to be four-story elevator because we, we believe them to have the most green space and probably have the most accessible parking um, for the active senior market. Approximately, and I'm certainly not gonna hold you to this, 
um, what's an average rent for a one bedroom to a three bedroom? I know there's going to be some changes, but you've got to have an idea about what that might cost. Yeah, yeah, honestly, as much as we can get. But <laughs> um, <laughs> we're, we're looking to probably have the one bedroom starting out around $1,000, the two bedrooms, thirteen to 1400 and the three is hoping to get around 1600 That's what some of the higher end comps on the peninsula are, are generating. Um, so uh, we'll probably start out during lease up with a little lower rent than that, hoping to ramp up to that rent by uh, lease up and stabilization. The y'all's uh, facilities include the like wireless, internet, uh, utilities type thing, or we we do. Um, we provide Wi-Fi at the pool and within the clubhouse. Um, each apartment will be wired with cable. Um, we have a, a number of. Um, things that we're trying to integrate into our apartments from a technology standpoint. Uh, sometimes we have intrusion alarms. That's our IT director sitting right over there. He's on the leading edge. Um, and then, of course, our clubhouse will have, um, we'll have um, security, we'll have cameras, we'll be gated, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a number of customer service related amenities, and then we'll have the physical amenities such as a, um, a large clubhouse, um, an exercise facility that's really more like a gym, and then a resort quality pool with a pergola, cooking stations, gas grills, um, zero entry um, pool, and so forth. And that's all inclusive? All inclusive. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, another question, since they're going to be four-story buildings and they're going to be ADA accessible, uh, do you plan to provide backup power in case of loss of electricity for elevators for the buildings? The elevators will be designed such that if power goes out, um, the elevators will go to the, the ground floor. We will not provide uh, generators, however. It's fairly customary in our business. Um, but I will tell you that our management philosophy is to mobilize a number of people to the community immediately to help our residents, particularly if there's a life safety issue involved. These buildings will be fully sprinkled. Um, they will have um, a number of connections in each of the breezeways to not only connect directly to a fire hose, but they'll be designed such that the fire trucks will be able to get a ladder on the roof uh, without the fire men even entering the building to put the fire out. These suppression systems are designed to give all the residents ample time to get out of the building uh, before it becomes dangerous. It's, it's code. I'm not, it's required. Other questions or comments? I do have pictures of four-story elevations that we've constructed on our last three communities. If that is, is a concern for anybody in terms of what they will look like, but I will tell you that four-story product with elevators is the new normal in the apartment business. We're about land preservation and having efficiencies, as Lamont said, in terms of um, the operating scale. Uh, so this is fairly. Um, Normal. I know it's not normal for Pocosin, but they'll be very attractive. Um, could you ask each of them to take one and pass them down? There are three very different architectural themes as we determine the elevations once we study the market. The apartments themselves will have nine foot ceilings, jip creep floors granite countertops, large um, cabinets, full-size washer and dryers. These are like the condominiums that you saw 10 years ago, honestly. I have a question. Has there been any um, core sampling at all in this area drilling down to see what type of soil you're dealing with and how, how much yes. pipes? Yes, there were core, uh, there were borings done. They're not perfect right now in the process of evaluating whether we will have to construct different kind of footings than typically would be required under very compactable soil. You get a lot of settling around here. It's, um, it's something that we're 
typically used to dealing with, both in how we design the foundation and how we um, dry out the soil that supports the foundation during construction. Wicking, as they call it. Other questions? Well, we certainly appreciate the Appreciate the time. We'll do a very good job in your community. I promise you'll be good, good neighbors. I had one, I had one question. The, the conceptual um, project, I think, called for uh, five, was it 528 or something like that? And you're going up to around, uh, what, 550, 560? Yeah, we were uh, originally, Mr. Chair, let's see, we were at 527, and I think we increased that by, by 29. 29 units, 557. 557. I would like to point out that that is still less than half of the density allowed by the plan development ordinance. So to, to us, it's, it's a fairly minor change in the overall scheme of it. However, it does go a long way toward helping us close the gap for, the, for that huge increase that we got in, in uh, surprise and mitigation costs. Mm -hmm. As far as the traffic flight, I did a study out here trying to pull in here a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say earlier, I'm sure a traffic engineer would have stopped watching. I'm not more, sure, more I'm not, I'm not sure how much one of those studies cost. Yeah. I just did one. I think it's minutes. more than 30 seconds to turn <laughs> in here. It feels like it anyway. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, we will reconvene in uh, about nine minutes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you.